When I came to the game of Xiangqi from the game of chess, there were lots of things that I could inherit from chess and apply to the game of Xiangqi. But there was a fair collection of things that I needed to unlearn or change. I wanted to make this video about things that chess players do wrong when they start playing Xiangqi. It covers stuff that I wish someone had told me earlier on. Hope it helps you. Okay, the first thing that I want to talk about is the difference between knights in chess and horses in Xiangqi. Uh, here's an example that I think many people have fallen for. So let's say we make our common middle cannon opening and black opens along a somewhat rare line that ploys something on the other side of the board. Let's say we develop our rook. Now the black cannon is still protected, so black can afford to develop his own. And if we move to the side, then, oops, our horse gets hemmed in. I think many of us have uh, fallen for that one. It's easy to overlook when you're still used to uh, moving your horse in a way that the knight does. Now, a couple of videos back, I did something similar about the horse. So let me reset the position. I think that went uh, something like this, where Red wanted to get his horse out in this fashion. And where I thought that let's go for the center because chess knights are good in the center, right? And black started kicking my horse around and the video looked something like this, which was really ugly. Now, to make sense of the biggest difference that, uh, or the biggest impact that the difference between horses and knights has, we should take a look at Terms that some might have learned in chess, but it might have been overlooked. Okay, so what I want to go to is a concept of activity of your pieces, but at odds against their vulnerability. Now, when I was a kid, I learned a lot about making your pieces active, but uh, this dyad was something that wasn't really paid attention to that much. I learned that only later. Now... As an example, let's play a chess opening that is the Scotch Gambit. I won't go into the details of that. Uh, I'm going to assume that most are familiar with chess here. So, d4 and the Gambit of bishop c4. And black lets his knight out. And uh, I want to put a bit of attention in the variation where white plays e5 here. Now, the most common answer for black on this knight being attacked is the counter push d5 attacking the bishop but the move that i want to look at uh, to make my point is knight e4 where you could argue the knight is in the center uh, it looks quite active but it can also become a bit of a target for the white pieces now, in many openings where a knight goes on to e4, you see uh, that white attacks it in some fashion, like knight d2 or so, and uh, black can reinforce the knight with d5 or f5 or such. Uh, in this line, though, we have bishop d5. So pawn d5 for black is no longer possible here, and pawn f5, well, you're not going to castle your king very soon then. So uh, black needs to escape with his active knight and make a move that in Xiangqi wouldn't be possible, but luckily knights cannot be blocked and we can escape towards c5. And white can continue in gambit style and castle. And uh, in this line, black makes yet another move to make his horse safe and, oh, sorry, I should say knight, <laughs> make that safe and give it a function of protecting this d4 pawn. Now, the point that I want to make about these moves is that back when we had knight e4 on the board, the knight was very active, but was also a bit exposed. 
Uh, I think that is the easiest difference that you can spot. Knights cannot be blocked and can therefore escape to safer uh, passages. But one difference that you should also notice in the final position is the functionality of chess pawns. So in this final position, both of the knights are very safe because they are protected by many pawns. And this is a second difference that we have with Xiang Qi. Chess pawns are very good at defending their pieces, especially the knights in this case, whereas in Xiang Qi, your pawns don't fulfill that function of protecting your horses. So if I go back to the horse position, and maybe Maybe let me get back a few moves. So, uh, no, not this one. This one was still over here and black attacked it. There is no way of having your pawns protect this guy. And if you want to uh, establish some level of protection, then your major pieces need to be bothered with doing that. So you'll need to go like this or move the rook out. I see there is a bit of difference because in my old example, I didn't have those resources. Uh, but it shows that in Xiang Qi, if you want to advance your horses, you're going to need assistance from your other major pieces to make sure that they won't get captured. And that, I think, makes for the largest difference in how easily uh, the vulnerability of your horses can show itself in opposition to how it manifests in chess. So the quick fix for that is, well, now you've seen some examples of this and have been more aware of the vulnerability i do hope that uh, you will restrain yourself a bit more from pushing your horses out early because they can easily be uh, encircled and captured okay for tip number two i want to move to a clear board and put just a few pieces on it uh we don't need that king for now uh have an elephant here and uh, I'll move this king up a bit. So we had a position in which red just delivered a check and the king moves up and well we could capture the pawn but what's the harm in giving another check and oops the elephant took our thing and this is a thing that happens a lot even beyond the beginner phase. So, of course, in the beginning we have that we give away our pieces against our opponent in all kinds of fashion, and that doesn't have a quick fix, so I'm not taking it up now. That has the slow fix of just playing more often, and you will get familiar with the pieces' movement. But this one, the elephant capturing you, is a tenacious one that even more experienced players still fall for every now and then. I think the reason for that is that elephants are seen as defensive pieces, which they are, and therefore uh, elephants capturing stuff is a blind spot that is difficult to get rid of. Now for the fix, let me go back to the clear board. And now the question to you before I advance further in the video is, let's say that you're red. Where are all the places that the black elephants can go to? Okay, if you found these, you would be correct. It's just seven of them. And what will help you is if you nail those points into your head, because these will need specific attention if you put any of your pieces there. Check if there is an elephant nearby that can capture it. Now, you might think that that sounds a bit of a, as a bit of a cheap trick, something that this duchy came up with. Let me show you an example of how even grandmasters use this one. So we had a position in an end game. I don't quite know the details, but uh, I do remember that uh, the two files on the right were clear. 
And what we are used to in chess is if there is any kind of rook endgame, I forgot where the black rook was, it's not relevant. Uh, then we move the rook as far away as we can, such that we can keep checking the king. And as we do so, then the king approaches diagonally in chess. I can't do this now, but that's how the king would approach. And that way we can give lots of checks, luring the king away from the left wing and then cross over. But in Xiangqi, that is not the case. Right? Uh, if you keep checking the king, it can only move straight up and down. Also, the king cannot leave the palace. So that would be an argument that wherever you move the rook to in this endgame, it doesn't matter for these two. But then I saw a grandmaster who put his rook on this file, which was to me a bit of an eye-opener. And I think the reason for that is that now all of these points are available for the rook and you never need to worry about an elephant that protects this point. Now, of course, a grandmaster isn't going to give anything away, but it does limit the rook's flexibility. Moreover, where the rook is standing now, could actually be a bonus point for blocking an elephant. So even grandmasters use this trick of being aware of where your elephants, where your opponent's elephants can go. Moreover, this is even something that you use in chess. Let me go back to chess to show that. So this is a funny position that I found on the internet in which the requester was wondering, hey, my engine with white to move recommends king g2 here. What kind of move is that? And why is that recommendation given? Or I think the most revealing answer is, well, white has the ambition to expand a bit in the center and put some pressure on some central squares. So f4 would be one way of doing that. Black, in the meantime, has plans to put some pressure on the white center with breaking moves like c5, getting rid of his weakest pawn and uh, provoking uh, these two pawns to come, to come off, which makes the d4 pawn easier to attack. If that d4 pawn ever moves, then this diagonal becomes open, especially if f4 has also been there. So just to avoid any nasty tactics, white plays king g2. This is the same thinking as we just did in Xiangqi. There were some squares marked as potential spaces for one piece to go to, and we just avoid the worst. So even you did this in chess. Now, going back to the Xiangqi position with the elephants, I think the moment you start marking these squares and or I shouldn't say squares, so these places, you will uh, avoid giving uh, away your pieces against elephants. Tip number three, or three, depending on where you live. Beware of mixing those up. I want to move to a correspondence game that I once played against a chess grandmaster. Uh, the chess grandmaster plays red in this game, and uh, I'm going to be a bit fast and loose with the orientation and some move orders. But let's agree that he moved his right cannon towards the center, such that I can keep my video a bit consistent. Actually, he moved the left one. Other than that, we'll follow the game pretty accurately. And we opened with... A very established opening, screen horse defense. Now, here my opponent made a bit of a peculiar move, even though this is very natural if you're a chess player, which is moving the horse to this place. I don't really hate the move, but it's not very common. And if I move over to analysis, then uh, theory teaches us uh, that other moves have the preference. If you really insist on moving this horse out, then theory would rather have you first push this pawn, placing the black horse in jail and clearing the path for your own. 
Now, instead, red chose to move his horse out and black did the common reaction then of freeing his own horse and putting the red horse in jail. Now, red followed some guidelines that I would recommend to beginners a lot. Get your major pieces out, get your rooks out. So he moved this one up one rank. And I did the same as I just did one move ago. Liberate my horse again and put one of red's horses in jail. Now, this position actually allows red to come back into theory. But for that, uh, you would need to uh, be aware of certain stuff. So the main theoretical move here is a bit counterintuitive and it's moving the rook all the way up. Now, if you spend your time memorizing theory like this, um, odds are that you're just going to forget. Um, I find that people who focus on gathering theoretical knowledge spend a lot of their time memorizing stuff, but that they won't be able to remember once they play it over the board. And if you find yourself in that situation, that is not a nice emotion. Uh, it's an outright hobby killer. Um, and I would rather not have that happen to you. So rather than remembering that in this position, you're supposed to move your rook up, a much more effective way of making sense of theoretical moves is if you remember what moves for red are strong or what moves for black, if you were to pass, are dangerous. Now, this pushes me to a bit of a not beginner lesson. This is more intermediate up to advanced. But since this is a very common pattern, I want to pay some attention to, a bit, to that. So you'll get a bit of opening skills lesson to boot while we're at it. Now, the move that is dangerous for red is this, which looks a bit peculiar. Um, it doesn't really develop any major piece. So what is the point here? Now, some of you might have spotted that there is a discovered check opportunity here. And then the rooks would see each other. But at the moment, that doesn't work. Red can capture with this horse and this rook is still protected. Moreover, even if this horse weren't there, it still wouldn't work because red can even recapture with this horse. Yes, the rook seems to be hanging, but in reality, red now has this move checking the black king again with the central cannon so black has to block and now we regain the rook so there was no discovered attack on the board yet making the you as audience wonder even more what is supposed to be so good about the move that black just made i want to analyze this a bit because uh, i feel that many opening theoretical books don't really do a proper job of explaining this constellation that we have on the three right files of the board. You might think that the situation is good for red if you're a chess player, because it's your rook that got on the open file. There is no further red pieces there. And uh, as soon as this cannon moves in any way to the side that isn't a check, then, let me move it away from the board. Then these rooks look at each other and you can trade making this horse go back. So that doesn't really qualify as a pin because the black rook wasn't hanging. But for all intents and purposes, uh, for all intents and purposes, big pun, this cannon cannot move to the side so this is somewhat of a pin and you might think that is good for red and it is 
an element that is good for red. Furthermore, you might think if you look at this constellation that there is two major pieces for red involved and three for black. So if none of that were to change for a little while, red is supposed to have a major piece extra on the other part of the board. So wouldn't that be good for red? And you would again be correct. Those two are things that are nice for red. Now for black. One thing that I mentioned beforehand, this discovered attack doesn't work now, but it might work later. And it is never going to go away uh, because this cannon has plenty of tactical opportunities. Let's say that the pawns were shifted a bit like this. That allows for a somewhat different situation, especially if the rook is still here, because we don't want any checks like that. Then this constellation is less worrisome, especially if you also have tactical opportunities of getting this horse out in some way. Now, if I put the pawns back, the pawn right next to the black cannon means that you will always have discovered attack opportunities. Oh, this is the position I was looking for. So that is one thing that is favorable for red, even oh, favorable for black even though it isn't working at the moment right now. A second thing that is nice for black is that this red rook cannot really escape. It's somewhat blocked from getting into the game. Now, true, you could argue that this rook is also busy guarding this cannon, but if later in the game you manage to activate pieces on the other side of the board, let me just teleport this rook all the way over here. Now this rook can go and become active towards other parts of the board. Whereas the red rook is still hemmed in. Now that is far away before you can protect this cannon in this fashion. But what is on the board now is that the red rook cannot really get into the game very comfortably. So that is also nice for black. The final point that is nice for black is the sense of timing. So I mentioned a few spatial elements here. There is a pin, there is a discovered attack lurking, there is a block. All of those three get dispelled as soon as black decides to move his cannon to the side. And black is in control of when that happens. So if for the following 20 moves or so, there is only one situation that is favorable for black, then that is when he will move this cannon. So that means that timing is on black's side. Those things all taken in together, uh, many theoreticians agree that whenever you see a constellation like this, it is already somewhat favorable for black. As mentioned before, that's not really beginner stuff, more of intermediate or advanced. But now that we're aware that that move for black is dangerous, it makes a lot more sense that theory would recommend breaking out with your rook on your own. Now, I won't go quite into why this move is supposed to be viewed as better than this. I think both of them make sense and are stuff that you as a beginner can relate to. So, going back to the game, uh, we've just had tip number three of studying theory in the wrong way. And let me now move to tip number four, which also needs this game. Uh, Red put his rook on an open file. Uh, I don't really care that much uh, which of the files he chose. In another game, he picked the other one. I think there are, there are minor differences, but... Nothing too uh, important to tackle here. I played the move of which we agreed it was dangerous. And now red has a bit of a problem to solve. Uh, there are several pieces that are hemmed in. So his red rook is blocked. We've had that. And both of his horses are placed in jail. 
Now, for the following plan, I think that Red had the correct idea of what to do about it, but chose the wrong methods. What he played was using this elephant to start pushing this pawn up and liberate his horse. That brings me to the next mistake, which is using your elephants or advisors in the opening. Um, it's not that that is bad in and of itself, but let's say that Red actually gets his way, right? So let me play some extra red moves. So we liberate our horse, we take, and the elephant recaptures. Now it seems as if this elephant was developed and as chess players, we learn to use all of our pieces, right? especially the minor ones. In Xiang Qi, it doesn't quite work that way because where can the elephant go now? And the answer is exactly the same places where it could go if it were still down. Moreover, when it stands over here, it easily gets in the way of our pieces. That's because our horse is now somewhat blocked if we move it over here. It's not really elephants or advisors jobs to advance. Instead, their uh, function is more to block things, keep the enemy pieces out from invading or clear space for your own pieces. With this elephant sitting on the river bank here, it's not clearing space for our own pieces. It's not stopping black from attacking our king. It's mostly in our way. A much better means of breaking out would have been to use a major piece for pushing up the pawns. And I think in this position, what makes the most sense is using this rook. That way you can prepare to pushing one pawn and recapturing and pushing the other one if you like. And the rook is very active, patrolling the river, and if there is ever some kind of pawn exchange, let's say this one, we're already putting some pressure on the black horse. Now, let me move back to the position at hand. And I want to say a quick thing about this, and uh, for that I want to move to the chessboard because I just taught you a rule don't play the elephants but is that something that I want you to follow blindly not quite I have a bit of a step plan in mind that you probably also already used in chess okay so I want you to deal with this rule of hands off your elephants and advisors in the same way that you should do it in chess First of all, when they teach you the rules in chess of opening play, pawns towards the center, move out minor pieces and get your king castled. The first thing I want you to do is follow that rule. So these are moves that we've all seen before and that we are very much used to. A move like bishop c4 makes sense or bishop b5. Next, we're going to castle our king at some opportunity doing nicely whatever we were taught. Now, as you get comfortable with that, I want you to aim towards um, making the rule a bit of a competition. So that is step two. We will uh, entice our opponent into making moves that waste time and that violate opening principles. So let's say if your opponent were to open with the Scandinavian, then as we got better in chess, we learned that it's good to take this pawn. And if black takes with the queen, now we can actually make a move that follows our rule and forces black to make yet another move that wastes opportunity. 
that would be step two. So we make a bit of a competition in the rules. We make moves that put our opponent under pressure and make them not develop pieces. The third step that I want you to do is craft the rule. So for example, we learn that one development move isn't quite as good as the other one in certain situations. If we go back to the position that we've observed before, we your coach will probably tell you that good moves are d4 or bishop c4 or bishop b5. And those are indeed the main moves. I don't think you will have seen many games that also follow the rule in which white moved bishop e2. And that's because the bishop is just way more active on c4 or b5. However, if black were to reply not with e5, but with the French defense, then you will probably not face many players who put their bishop on c4 or b5, because it just becomes a target. Given black's pawn structure, now all of a sudden the bishop move to c4 makes very little sense. And, and way more often, you'll get a structure like this, in which the bishop stands well on either e2 or d3, aiming at black's castle king's position. So, this was step three. We craft the rules a bit. We learned that one developing move isn't really the same as the other one. Finally, step four, we break the rule. Let me once again go back to the Italian opening. And uh, I think one variation that uh, shows this quite well is the fried liver, or at least the preparation for that. We have two pieces attacking f7, therefore d5 is forced. And here is a gambit that I liked to play with black back in the day, which is, d is b5. Now, this throws a bit of chaos into the position and it's very playful. It's also very difficult for white to find the best move if you haven't faced this before. Natural moves are using your bishop to take this pawn or using your pawn to take this knight. And it's even not unheard of to play bishop e2 in this variation where you allow black to capture on d5. And black might sometimes respond in a way that doesn't take the pawn instantly, but instead plays knight d4. Now, the best move in this position breaks all rules that we have learned of. Oh, I beg your pardon. Keep doing this. Okay. The best move in this position is actually bishop f1. Violating all the rules that we have learned. And the point of bishop f1 is twofold. First of all, g2 is protected. Such that when queen d5 happens, there is no threat over here. And white can now gain time by kicking the queen around, and wherever the queen goes, let's say here, uh, now we can move the bishop out again with nice game of time. Also, thanks to bishop f1, knight d4 isn't nearly as good because there is no pieces that it's attacking. So the knight is very vulnerable here, and we kick it away again. So as we gain more as we gain more experience in this game, we learn of some exceptions where undeveloping or breaking our rules is actually good. But if you want to get to that point, you first want to be comfortable with following the rule and doing the other steps of making competition out of it and crafting the differences before you understand why you can break a certain rule. Now, if we go back to the Xiangqi game, 
This game is actually quite dear to me because this is the first time that outside of all theory, I broke my own rule. After Red moved his elephant out, I also played an elephant move. And this looks a little bit strange, I think. More, more natural would have been to uh, clear a file and put the rook over here. Th that would be following my rules. So why did I play this move? It uh, looks a bit weird, doesn't it? Now, red went on, pushed, following to plan. Am I taking now? Which would make red play another elephant move. That would be good, right? I broke my rule again and pushed this horse out. Wait, what? What's the point with that? Red continued his plan. If you are not changing, if you're not taking the pawn, then I'm going to do it. Are you going to take with your elephant now? Here is where the point of me breaking my rules showed itself. This rook now comes running into the game. And if we flip over to analysis, black is already very comfortable here. Um, if you take, then black takes a horse right back and now two cannons are hanging. So red just loses a cannon outright. It's a bit funny that the cannon in the middle is hanging. That is very rare. Usually it's protected by one or two elephants. But the elephant on the left has moved somewhere else. And the elephant on the right is blocked. So that's a bit funny. But if you cannot take, that means that the whole red setup has been refuted. Because next move... I'm going to take, and now my rooks are just way more active than the red ones. Black is very comfortable here. Uh, within just two moves, I already put my rook in a very active place, where it is putting pressure on a red horse. And that is pretty rare. Usually, when you make two rook moves, uh, it looks a bit like this guy which isn't doing anything in particular yet. Uh, if we take stock of the black position here, uh, my rook on the left is way more active than this one. Also, this rook is still blocked as we agreed beforehand. So therefore this rook is better. This horse is also very active, better than any of the red horses. And moreover, we learned that if you push horses forward, they can get exposed, they can get vulnerable. None of that is the case here. All of these entry points that red would want to use are protected. So the black horse is very safe and comfortable here. Black enjoys a great game. And in, eventually I did manage to win it. Beforehand, we talked a bit about the value of pawns in Xiangqi, especially in the opening. And that brings us to tip number five, which is protecting your own pawns, investing time. So let's follow this with an example game. And I will stick with my personal favorite screen horse defense. And uh, here we have another uncommon move by Red, which is moving the Rook up. This is played every now and then, but it's not mainstream. Now, how to respond to this as Black, though? I think many of you watching, seeing that your pawn is under attack, might choose to move it up. And that is a move that I don't hate. Uh, not only because it protects your pawn, but also it liberates your horse and it puts Red's horse in jail. So there are some side effects that come with it. Suppose that Red goes pawn hunting now. Now, I think a common trap is that players with black would fall in love with their pawn and would try to protect it again. 
Now, the first move that they would come up with is moving the elephant like this. Now, quick, before I move on the video, why is this move definitely wrong? What goes wrong here is that we put too many pieces on the third rank and the horse falls. The cannon didn't see the horse anymore. Let me put these back. Now, you might therefore conclude that if we can't put an elephant in the center, then surely this has to be the best move, right? This is the only move that protects all of the attack pieces, except for the edge pawn, but fair enough. Yet, this violates the fifth rule that I want to teach you, uh, which is, okay, so we learned that we shouldn't move elephants unless we can explain it to our rubber ducky. And I can envision that we explain a way that we are protecting the pawn. But the rule that I want to teach you here as a quick fix is that protecting your pawn is not good enough of a reason to spend moves on not developing your pieces. Now, a much more common way to play for black, uh, because I don't see this in any of the uh, published games, um, would be to uh, entice red to take pawns, because if red were to take our pawn now, that would be yet another move played, another tempo invested, that doesn't really raise the potential of a rook or any major piece. A very common move in this position is cannon to the back. Okay, which prepares moving the cannon to the side, which would incidentally protect our pawn as well. But let's say that red picks up the gauntlet and takes this pawn now. The effect is we attack it as advertised and red doesn't really have many places to go now. Now, if we take one possible branch, that would be moving his rook over here, which already I'm not a big fan of either solution. I suppose that uh, black would move up the elephant and prepare to attack the rook now using the horse. And this time I did move the elephant to make sure that we don't get any attack going on, on our own horse. But, let me go back to our sample game. Let's say that black from this position chooses the other solution, which is the final safe place on this file. We will happily trade and black and red recaptures. So red now has made so many moves with his rook and it's not very clear what the rook is doing in this spot. Moreover, black has several options here. Now, if you still fall in love with pawns, I wouldn't blame you if now you would be enticed to capture this pawn here with an attack on the elephant. Uh, so red needs to waste time responding to that. And this is a fine move. But this cannon, which often uh, sees this spot in the screen horse defense, is really well placed here. Look at all the juicy targets that there are on this file. I think a stronger move than taking the pawn right now is advancing our major pieces again with a threat. So I think horse over here would be a perfectly fine move. The cannon targets some juicy stuff behind the enemy pawn and we have some nice ways of infiltrating with the black horse either by capturing the pawn or over here. Uh, I think that although red is up a pawn here, uh, black has completely refuted the red setup. Now, I want to make a bit of a point towards the value of pawns in general, because as we saw, 
Uh, Red did us a bit of a favor by taking the pawn away and clearing our horse path. Now, as I wanted to say in the opening, Xiangqi pawns aren't really the same as in chess. Now, if we remember that in the chess game, let me set that up real quick. Here we go. In this chess game, we can say that pawns, as we learn, are worth one point, but they have a lot of jobs. They can protect our pieces, they control some key squares, and pawns are also in the chess game used a lot for blocking files and diagonals, which keeps our pieces safe and sometimes our king. If we look at the Xiangqi board, however, and let me head back to the beginning position. What places are protected here? Every single pawn doesn't even have a structure. All they do is guard the one space right in front of them. Moreover, it doesn't really block any files or diagonals in that sense. If anything, these pawns are in the way of our own pieces. So, one could argue that in the opening, pawns don't really show their value of one point yet. Maybe only the central pawn is somewhat of an exception, in the sense that we definitely don't want to see a cannon here. Though that has more to do with this cannon facing the naked king than really the value of a central pawn. Now, as we move over to the end game, though, that's when things change a bit. So let's say that we have this position. This is winning for red. Take my word for that if you don't know it. It's not easy to do it, but it is winning. So if we are trying to put the win out of uh, our position, then we can argue that three pawns are worth more than four defensive pieces. And I would argue that if you're trying to win a game, then a pawn is worth more than a defensive piece. But that's only in the end game when most of the pieces have cleared the board and we actually can afford to invest time into pushing our pawns across the river. Now, the value of pawns, especially versus defensive pieces like elephants and advisors, is a bit of a strange dynamic thing. For example, if I were to switch to this position here, where red is up a full rook, okay, I'm not trying to catch anyone off here, but this position is drawn. That's not some kind of smart uh, remark that somehow defensive pieces are worth something. The point that I want to make is comparing it to another position where I remove one elephant and give black an extra pawn. This position is actually losing for black. Red can use this rook to collect the stray pawn for black and then black is, will be only left with one elephant which means that it's not two that can protect each other. The elephant will be weakened, vulnerable and red will just collect that. Winning the game will be a bit technical, though. So what I'm trying to say here is that the value of pawns and light pieces is a bit of a strange thing in Xiangqi. It's a situational thing that I wouldn't put on a scale as we do it in chess. Now, chess has plenty of exceptions already. Uh, we learn, for example, that in the opening, rooks aren't necessarily worth their five pieces that we learn from chess. In the opening, they stand in the corner and are roughly worth uh, the equal value of a knight and bishop. Only in the end game, when stuff trades off, that's when you know how powerful a rook is. But I would say that Xiang Qi even does more of a dance with these piece values. So, as said beforehand, I think in the opening, Pawns have almost more against them than for them. And only in the end game, they get more value than a defensive piece if you're trying to win. So then it's two. You might wonder at which phase of the game is the pawn actually worth one point? And the answer is, I don't know. I've played this game for a long while and I don't think such a phase really exists. And if it does, it's really thin. I think the one point that we learn as a material value for pawns is more of an average.
but you should be aware that this stuff dances around a lot. And if your opponent is after your pawns in the opening, I would recommend considering maybe we should just let them. My final point is something that I see in chess and Xiangqi alike. And I feel this might be the most important one. Many people do it wrong because it's very difficult to get right. It concerns not, belief, not being fully aware of what you really want and taking a pathway that leads to a place you don't want to end up. Now, to prove that, let's say that I hear people ask, can you give me tips on making sure that I win games? Also, if I don't lose quickly, that would be nice. I want to gain rating points and I want to become stronger. And you would think that all of these four things overlap, but they don't. You will find them at odds with each other. And if you pick one that disaligns with what you really want, you might end up not quite as happy as you think you will. Let me prove this point. Okay, let's say that you are the type of player who wants to get better at the game. I'll discuss both chess and Xiang Qi in this one. Um, the best way to get better is by playing games that challenge you and that are instructive. Which means that if you get checkmated within six moves or such, brilliant! That is something that we can latch on to and that we can learn from. These are easy to process and we come out of the next game stronger. We're taking almost the path of an anime hero. Now, how I would recommend you to uh, the type of games you want to play is usually quite long enough that you can put yourself to a bit of a challenge. If you're blitzing out moves, then um, you don't really challenge your brain. It's more of a quick reaction thing. If you want to get better at the game, I would recommend setting some tasks for your brain. Now in chess, I think one opening that aligns with this path really well, and it's very popular by coaches and by the internet, is the Evans Gambit. And the reason for that is, well, first of all, we follow opening principles as we've learned them, right? We move our pieces in. Further on, there is an investment that we make. Here we invest one pawn and we entice black into wasting opportunity. And instead we want to develop ourselves very quickly. This is an opening that I would recommend for chess beginners, usually if they are somewhat mature. Um, adults are really good at this one. Kids who are too young uh, might not really be comfortable with the concept of investment yet. Uh, they would rather just take stuff. But if you're watching this video, my guess is that most of you are adults and I think this aligns really well. One example game is by Paul Morphy against not Morphy, where how we play forward follows the principles that we learn from chess. So even if we are outside our theory here, we can learn, we can uh, check some general chess skills and see if they help us find the inspiration for coming up with moves that are strong. One principle that we learn is one pawn in the center is nice. Two, if you can have it stable, is even better. So we do that. Also kicking the bishop again. We learned to develop pieces, so moving the knight out is a natural move. And we also learned that if we are ahead in development and we have castled and the opponent's king hasn't, then we want to open up the board, especially the central files. We've already done some investment, might as well put some more uh, wood into the fireplace. So e5 makes total sense. Black takes. And remember how we said that we want to develop and keep our opponent's king in the middle? Bishop a3 achieves both of these targets. 
Now, black can also develop, and he did, bishop g4. And the next thing that we learn is not only do we want to develop our pieces, we want to put them on squares that are aggressive and put our opponent under pressure. Queen b3 is a very natural move, aiming for this weakened f7 pawn. Black has to waste time again by defending. Where were we again? Oh yeah, opening the position. The e5. Because when the position is opened and the cent for the central files, then our rooks can get into the game and start hunting the king and queen. Here's where Paul Morphy asked himself, where were we again? Oh yeah, opening the position. E6. Now, black chose to keep the central file closed, so declined to open and moved f6. And here we see something funny, which is that if you're a way ahead in development, we learned a lesson earlier on about activity and vulnerability, right? It's when you have such a magnificent development lead that your opponent's pieces that once were active become vulnerable targets. Here, Paul Morphy spit, uh, uh, spotted this weak bishop on h5. Gave that a bit of a kick. Bishop had to move. And after bishop d5, black resigned. There's too much pressure on the knight on c6. And one logical follow-up would be if pawn attacks, then check. We check again. Only legal move is queen d7, checkmate. And there you go. It's a very clear uh, demonstration of how following general opening principles can make you a stronger player. We didn't really follow any lines of, oh, in the Evans Gambit in particular, you need to think of these exceptions. No, we can rely on solid principles that we learned and uh, put on a good game with just that. So that's why the Evans Gambit is very popular with coaches. But it will also mean sometimes you won't succeed in breaking through. And that usually means at beginner level that there is some kind of attack or opportunity that you missed. That all the better. That's stuff that we can pull ourselves up on. But it does mean that every now and then you will lose a game and pretty quickly. Let's move over to Xiangqi. Now, the openings that I would recommend for Xiangqi is several of them. I think if you are red and you want to get strong at the game and you want to challenge yourself, I would definitely go with the most popular move, which is the central cannon. Now, Xiangqi is a bit of a funny game of advantages and disadvantages. And this move is certainly very committal. What happens here is that uh, we put some pressure on the black central file, but it does mean that we won't be able to defend our position very comfortably. There are few points that become quite weak. One of them is we just put the cannon on the place that usually elephants also like to be at, such that they can connect with each other. Remember the seven places where elephants can go? As long as the central one is occupied, they won't, even, they won't be able to see each other. And that means that elephants often get exposed in any system that involves a central cannon. And you will get beaten up quite a lot. But that's good. Remember how in an earlier example there was a cannon over here and stuff was gone? Believe me, I've walked into lots of forks. I've gotten crushed. I know what a cannon smothered checkmate looks like. Then, after falling for that a couple of times, I learned that to pay a bit more attention to whether there is any elephants hanging. Another typical weak point in the central cannon system is uh, your horse on the left. If you move it to its quote unquote proper place. 
that's because this horse is very difficult to defend by a faraway cannon. And you usually need to invest time in making sure that it doesn't get trapped and keeping it more active, less vulnerable. This piece will need a lot of babysitting if you play the central cannon system. Yet, it's also very sharp. Uh, one uh, system that I would definitely recommend for black, if you're trying to improve, we've talked about this on more occasions, is the screen horse defense, which looks like this. And what I like a lot about this one is, and is that there is a large imbalance here. Uh, red once has much aggression on the central file and wants to get an attack going. Black wants to counter against the weak targets like elephants and this exposed horse or whatever else comes to the table. Um, this opening I think is the most popular because it for both colors because it's both sharp and it's sound. You can uh, put some of your own flavor in it but still follow general opening principles of developing your pieces and putting your opponent under pressure. Now, for black, I could recommend other systems as well. It's not that the screen horse is the only one that I like. Uh, for example, the sandwich cannon, which is a bit more solid. Uh, it's called a sandwich because here the cannon is in between the horses. Um, a bit more of a defensive setup. Uh, there is a small trap that uh, Red can have trouble developing his horse because this is a skewer. Oops. Uh, but other than that, Black is trying to set up a bit more of a solid position and uh, by, let's say, developing like this or, or like this. Or if Red sees that this uh, right horse is a bit exposed and starts teleporting a rook over there, then adjusting like this works. This system works rather well and is flexible. I like that too. And one system that I could also recommend because it is very challenging and combative is the opposite sorry, is the same direction cannon that I wanted to go for. Uh, if you don't know any better from chess, then this might look a bit timid because it looks symmetrical, but it really isn't. As soon as we bring these pieces out, uh, Red has several options, uh, taking the open file or moving up and taking an open file that is a bit closer to where horses are going to be weak. Or putting Black's horse in jail and liberating your own. And what Black will do is pick any of these other advantages and say, and say, I'm more familiar with this position than you are, and I'm going to outplay you. Any of these three systems works really well for following general principles that can help you find strong moves anyway. Now, the second type of player that I want to go to is maybe you don't like the idea of being beaten up quickly. Uh, maybe it happens that if you get taught what the smothered cannon checkmate looks like, that will demotivate you. And that's fair game. I do want you to spend time in on this game in a way that you enjoy. Well, what you probably want to go follow is something that is a bit more risk avoid. Now, let's first follow a chess example. And I think the most well-known opening that is safe and also got very popular, especially lately over the internet, is first d4, and then whatever black plays, we go the London, which looks like this. Uh, 
The London has a lot of advantages. It's a very safe opening. It's also very decent. Your pieces are on good squares. And yeah, it, it achieves exactly what we want here. We don't like losing games quickly, if that's the type of person you are. And yeah, that's not going to happen here. You're not going to get queen takes f2 checkmated if you play the London. Now, what you should know, though, is that the benefit of the London system is also its deficit. We don't need to think about how to arrange our pawn structure or where to put our light pieces because the system does that for us. That is very nice for getting a game going that you will survive for a while. But it also means that if at any point you want to divert or need to, or you choose to play things a bit differently or you, or you get challenged by your opponent into thinking for yourself, now we're entering a domain that we, really, that we uh, didn't really train ourselves to because we played a ready-made system. So if you play the London or start playing it, here is what typically will happen. This is a very safe system and your rating is going to go up. The reason is, is that you're not going to make any opening mistakes. That's a plus. Also, the London is very solid and it's not easy to beat with black, which means that people of your own rating or, me, or maybe even uh, 100 points more won't have quite a clue what to do against this thing. As such, you will draw stronger opponents, sometimes beat one and your rating will go up. But then at some point, if you think you're on a roll and you want to improve, now, let's say that you started at 900 and you started playing the London and made your way up to 1100. Now, good on you. You gained 200 ELO points and I will argue that you deserve them. But we need to realize that how we got here was we're at 900 tactical and opening skill and we started playing a very decent opening. If we're trying to improve against players who are 1100 universally, then we're going to hit a roadblock. Moreover, if at any point you want to try something different because you get bored with the London or so, now you, will, now you are playing a less solid system against people who are 200 ELO points more trained at good opening play than you were. Now, I don't think there's such a thing as a point of no return. And if you played the London and you enjoyed that, then go ahead doing so. But please do realize that if you always go for this setup without overthinking it, um, it's going to be difficult for you to find means of improvement because you will notice that you are under trained in certain areas of the game. Tempo wise, if you want to avoid losing quick games, I wouldn't go for blitz because they are filled with traps. I would go for a slightly long tempo, but it doesn't need to be quite as long as the player who wants to improve. Now, for Xiangqi, I do still want to give you a recommendation. Uh, it's not that I'm against this or so. I'm just more of the former type. Uh, I find that easier to identify with. But I can imagine that it is bad for your motivation if you lose quick games. And, and if that bothers you. Or maybe... Uh, you're not quite that player type, but you are temporarily in that situation. Let's say that you have a Xiangqi tournament next week, or maybe you're even, if, even uh, right in the middle of one. Hi. And you don't want to get quick defeats because it means that you will spend the rest of the round, maybe an hour, waiting for all of the other people to finish. Rather than that, 
if only for the next tournament, you want to get somewhat of a surviving game going. Now, with red, I would no longer recommend the central cannon. I would recommend anything else. Uh, because that leaves the central place free for your elephants. I don't want to really go too deeply in any of these openings because then this is going to become more of an opening video than it already needs to be. But I do want to give you a recommendation for black. And I want to say something funny about this one because uh, first I want to give you an opening that I don't recommend for any type, regardless of who you are, if you're fresh into Xiang Qi. The system that I don't recommend and that we didn't yet see as an answer against the central cannon in this video is the opposite direction cannon. Now, this is perfectly playable and there are grandmasters who play like this. But what I have against this system is that you're always one step behind this black. Red develops, so do you. Red develops, you might choose to do the same, which isn't a very good move already uh, for tactical reasons that I don't want to get into. Or you might defend your cannon here, but then that horse can become a bit exposed. You can lose games very quickly in this opening. And this is the kind of setup in which I do one thing, you do another is very beneficial for red in the sense that even if red doesn't make the very best move, they're probably still going to do something a bit productive. And even though you might have a better move ready than red and you play a better one, red might still have very easy play because it's red's move again. This is the kind of setup in which red can afford to make two or three mistakes before really getting the game against them. Whereas with black, if you make but one mistake, you might be done. And moreover, both for the training person and for the non-losing person, you might have lost without it really being obvious why you lost. Because red is faster than you. Now, the opening that I would recommend is somewhat close to the opposite direction, but we're going to delay that a bit. First of all, I would recommend moving this horse out, familiar turf from the screen horse defense. Again, we put this rook to the open file. Now, if red does anything else than the most popular move, then as black, we are going to take the open file for ourselves. And that overlaps with my recommendation for improving players as well. But most players will take the file against you. And here comes the move that I would recommend as a safe system that you can rely on. And that is this cannon forward. Now, this comes close to a constellation that we saw before. The move that is dangerous if black can play it is this pawn up and then we go into a pattern that we've seen before. That means that uh, as far as red is concerned there is really only one move that is considered viable and that is pushing this pawn yourself. But now we have uh, enticed red into making a pawn move rather than the major piece. What we're going to do now with black is very quickly develop the major pieces on our other wing. This one goes to the center only now, which means that we didn't get crushed on the wing where it was developing. And next we move our pieces out either to the open file, which is the standard way, or you can also elect to move this guy one may up, one place up, and then have our sweet chariot swing low. Uh, there are several ideas behind this crossover move. First of all, 
there is a nasty threat of opening up this file and if red takes now we have an in-between move or in correct english zwischenzug and black already has a very dangerous attack here you can move this to the corner and with nasty double checks and discoveries you don't want this as red and other ideas that black has uh, besides opening this file is moving is somewhat adjusting his position by shifting this cannon to the side which looks like a waste of time but we couldn't do that immediately our first cannon move this horse was still over here and we wouldn't have anyone protecting the central pawn so this cannon had to go to the center first and only now we can afford to readjust and how we can build our position now is that we have a very solid wing on the left viewing from red whereas on our own left and red's right we have almost all of our major pieces involved and that is where the tactics are going to happen and we will overpower red on this wing whereas on the empty wing red will lack targets to achieve anything i think that this opening out of all is by far the most reliable and safe system against the central cannon now that is not to say that black is necessarily already better uh, even though we provoked red into not developing a major piece other than giving our ho his horse a bit of air yes we are faster theory still thinks that red is slightly better here and i kind of agree with that but the black play is very easy and still allows for some room of improvisation and creativity on your own part finally a third type of player that you can be is that your definition of fun isn't necessarily in improving or avoiding losses it's about quick wins it's about trapping your opponent it's about foxy stuff and going <laughs> when your opponent falls for yet another trap that you prepared for them i think in chess one thing that makes total sense if you just came into the game is yep going for the scholar's mate and you will fool people with that and if that is your definition of having fun and if it is more power to you please play the game in whatever way that you enjoy uh if we move a bit further up the rating ladder one thing that we might also have learned from the internet it got quite popular is the Stafford Gambit. Uh, if you're on, uh, if you follow chess YouTube, you probably have heard of this one, where we see heroes like Eric Rosen running straight through white, and uh, yeah, getting his pieces into an attack immediately, uh, sacking the knight. If you take it, then the H file is a bit too open for white's liking and so i think i once saw an international master with white against eric rosen playing g3 here which uh, also doesn't work you can take that pawn because the f pawn is pinned and white got crushed fun isn't it well i can totally see this um the thing with trappy openings like the stafford or the Otto Schnapp or, or the Scholar's Mate is that at some point they stop working your opponent will be prepared for them and if at that point you're no longer having fun or you wish to improve then you might run into trouble it's a bit of a similar concept of the safe ELO spike um, but even more so I have seen an international master fall for this. So you could, I guess, Stafford yourself 300 ELO points up. But then when you get there, 
did we really get there by playing these moves ourselves or are we playing prepared recipes the moment that you find that you are facing stronger opposition you will have the same trouble of for gaining elo points as the safe player had e only even more so uh, this is quite a contrast with the player who wants to improve right the moment we set early challenges in the opening if you do that when you already play the game for a bit of a while you will notice that your elo will actually get a bit of a dip you will go down because you are losing in ways that you didn't learn before but if you're the improving player or changed to an improving player that's fine there is no point of no return and it's never too late to start learning how to defend yourself in a challenging position so the improving player will find a bit of a rating dip but move up later the safe and the fun trappy player will get an elo spike but then run into a plateau and the moment that they start changing their openings, their ELO will go down. And this brings me to the conclusion of people sometimes choose the path that they don't really want. Uh, it's very easy to be swayed by any of these three solutions for how you should play, but that isn't really you. Uh, let me quickly finish off the... Uh, fun type for Xiang Qi examples. Um, yeah, I thought about this one for a while and I struggle what to recommend here really. Uh, I'm not very familiar with many opening traps that are easily accessible. I think the one that I came up with easiest is this riverbank cannon, which uh, aims for all kinds of tricks that your opponent might fall for but as black i'm usually not too impressed seeing this i will just develop one of my horses if you attack it i can defend my horse with the far away cannon and next move i will kick your cannon away or if you attack one of my elephants same thing i can develop the horse and i'm perfectly fine I'll kick you away next move, and if you want to attack my rook, that's okay. Do you want to trade the cannon now after having made all these moves? Um, yeah. It's easy for me to come up with a bit of a refutation of the most, of the simplest red tricks here, but that is just stuff that I'm more familiar with. Um, I said, I'm afraid I'm not very familiar with opening traps for black. Although, thinking of one now, I think you can uh, play something that I have fallen for already a few times. Which looks like this. Uh, which puts the cannon on a protected point, And what you're hoping that red will fail to notice... is that this cannon has quite a threat of making this rook go back to the corner hiding in shame now this is hardly an overwhelming advantage but this is the most is the trappiest thing for black that i could come up with if you are a trappy player this is probably the personality that fits most with playing a quick game. You want to play Blitz such that your opponents won't have the time to think of any antidotes. So, summary, putting in an image here. Um, again, I don't want to discourage anyone from playing into a particular style you're welcome to play the game in any way that you enjoy but please do realize that if you choose a certain path there might be a thing waiting for you that you don't really see coming 
And it's stuff that I wish people had told me earlier on when I was still playing openings that were trappy in chess. Now, the final thing I want to say about this is more of a tip towards stronger players who want to help other players improve. They might come, they might come to you with a question like, can you teach me a specific opening, 15 moves deep, or uh, they might ask you, do you have any tips for improvement? They might ask you for very concrete opening systems. And my recommendation is please don't give them the solution that they ask for because finding the correct solution is difficult. They came to you for advice. So start listening for the personality that the person has and what their ambitions and emotions are. That way, it's easier for you to find a good match for the path that they really want to take rather than the path that they thought of and are asking your confirmation for. And with that, I want to conclude this video. I thank you for watching. I understand that there is many things that you might run into that I didn't think of or that just didn't make the cut for this video. If that is the case, yeah, I had to narrow it down, but I actually want to invite you. Is there some problem that you run into and that you would like to see tackled? Or is there a problem that you once ran into and then you found a quick fix for it yourself? I'm very curious to your experience. Please share. And with that, thank you for watching. See you again, but in the meantime, Mind your step on the way out.